and welcome to Bloor Street and St. Matthew's United Church Faith Communities together on this Thanksgiving weekend in October. It's good to have you here as we reflect on gratitude with as an amazing backdrop this artistry provided by Isabel Ward, some heavy lifting by Garnet that has brought together this scene that is so evocative and rich and colorful and we are, we are really grateful for that. <laughs> some of us I know find it a little jarring to feel grateful when we see horrific images of war in the news and, and you know that's, that's okay. That's okay, more than a year has passed and any end to this Israeli-Palestinian conflict feels further away than, than ever. And it's hard to feel grateful when others suffer so profoundly. And then there's the war in Ukraine, and the US election and hurricanes. And yet some of us feel great excitement at the return of a student who's been away at school and is coming home for the weekend some are filled with deep gratitude for health, for hope and promise, the joy of life in all its abundance. I suspect most of us feel a confusing mix of all of those things this Thanksgiving, and that is what we bring to this time. If we can welcome all the mixed or difficult emotions, I think that itself is a gift. It's hard, but it's better than ignoring or denying or numbing ourselves so we don't acknowledge those emotions and the depths of life when we dare to feel all of those emotions that are in our heart this Thanksgiving. At least it's real and it's honest and I'm grateful for that. So whether you are here or on Zoom, most Sundays or come by now and then as you're able or if this is your first time coming by to worship in this place, I'm glad you are here because what happens as we gather, as we are met by God and God's Spirit in this place, will be different because you're here, because you are a part of it. As we gather to worship, we acknowledge the land. We recognize that we have assembled on land that is sacred a traditional gathering place for many peoples of Turtle Island. To show respect for this long history, we acknowledge that we gather on the traditional territory of several indigenous nations and pay special recognition to the Mississauga of the Credit. And also as we gather at this time, we know God's presence is among us. And we light this candle as warmth, as love, as light for our path, as a symbol of God with us, reminding us that we are not alone. I invite you to join me in a prayer of awareness, a prayer of opening as we enter into worship this day. God, holy and wonderful, loving and agonizing over this world of ours, we gather. We come together on a common spiritual journey, a shared yearning to find words that express our search for meaning, to find partners with whom we can work to make a difference in the world, and most of all, to settle into your loving presence that is personal embrace. In you and here with others, we discover what life can be, relentlessly loving, abundantly forgiving, and radically free. Thank you for offering such life to us again, and then again, and again. Thank you for removing barriers and opening doors, for deepening our questions, reawakening hopes and dreams. Give us clear vision, enduring values, 
and enough love and courage to put our faith into practice through all the common scenes of life. We pray in the name of Jesus, who we seek to follow. Amen. We begin by reading Psalm 126 responsively, which is found in Voices United 850, and we will sing refrain number two. We begin by singing the refrain. <laughs> When God brought Zion's captives home, it seemed to us like a dream. But then our mouths were full of laughter and our tongues uttered shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, God has done great things for them. Truly, God has done great things for us, and therefore we rejoice. We Restore our fortunes, O God, as streams refresh the Negev. Those who tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed for sowing, shall come home with songs of joy, bringing in their sheaves. Our Gospel reading is Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. A man ran up to Jesus. That's how the story starts in Mark. We do not know anything about the man. Unlike Luke, Mark gives us no, ti no title, nor does he tell us anything about his economic status until the end. He is just a man. However, he is a man who wants an answer to an urgent question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? As we read Jesus' response, the urge to soften the overwhelming sense of demand is nearly irresistible. Yet at the same time, this attentive, devout, sincere, and open-hearted man is the only person in the entire Gospel of Mark who is singled out as being loved by Jesus. We have no idea what became of the man as he simply vanishes from the scene. And yet we are still struck by his brief exchange with Jesus and the conversation with the disciples that follows. Our reading is Mark 10, 17 to 31. As Jesus continued down the road, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? No one is good except the one God. You know the commandments. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Don't cheat. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he responded, I've kept all of these things since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him carefully and loved him. He said, you are lacking one thing. Go sell what you own 
and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But the man was dismayed at this statement and went away saddened because he had many possessions. Looking around, Jesus said to his disciples, it will be very hard for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom. His words startled the disciples, so Jesus told them again, children, it's difficult to enter God's kingdom. It's easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter God's kingdom. They were shocked even more and said to each other, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them carefully and said, it's impossible with human beings, but not with God. All things are possible for God. Peter said to him, look, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, I assure you that anyone who has left house, brother, sisters, mother, father, children, or farms because of me and because of the good news will receive 100 times as much now in this life. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and farms and also troubles, and in the coming age, eternal life. This is once again the great reversal. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. In this reading, we hear God's voice. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. The pace is picking up. The issues, the confrontations, the misunderstandings, and the distractions are mounting as Jesus slowly makes his way to Jerusalem with his circle of friends and followers along. Having just made a point of, of drawing attention to a child as an object lesson as an illustration for his words about God's upside-down view of power and position, Jesus is approached by an adult, a mature, articulate, sincere, religious, and we learn seemingly successful man, who asks something to the effect of, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do I need to do to obtain a fuller, a more whole and authentic life of spiritual depth in relationship with God? Inherit. Well, when we inherit, really, it's in a way an entitlement. We've been willed certain things of value, obtain, as in buy or earn. The man assumes, understandably enough, that whatever is involved, it's a matter of doing something. So Jesus responds by asking the man about his fulfillment of the law, the commandments, prompting the man's sincere reply, I have kept all these things since I was a boy. Now, I doubt he means he kept 100% of them 100% of the time, but he's clearly an earnest man, clear in his intentions with a degree of self-discipline. And yet for all of that, he's been left reaching for something more. Jesus doesn't chuckle about his keeping of the law or speak down to the man's heartfelt piety. Instead, Jesus looked at him, we're told, intently, we imagine, and he loved him. This total stranger, this confused, if well-meaning man, Jesus loved him. Seeing deeply, Jesus then says one thing you lack, or you're missing one thing. And the man must be relieved because he's come to Jesus with that precise awareness that he's missing something in life, in his faithful life. 
And Jesus turns and says to him, you're right, something is missing. The one thing, the main thing, the only thing, and it's not about something you need to do or something that you will obtain. It's something you have to do less of, less of the striving, less trying so hard and still feeling like it's not enough. It's never enough. For you, the missing thing is learning to let go. Let go of your confidence in your own achievements and abilities. Let go of your assumption that you've earned the degree of wealth you have in life through hard work and careful investing. Let go of the notion that you can control, manage, generate your life through your own capabilities. Self-made. The point is, come and follow me. Which is precisely what this man cannot do. Which he's unable to do because he's enmeshed in life. He's enmeshed in his achievements, his commitments. He can't extricate himself. He has other priorities. In God's upside-down world that turns our world right side up, it's about letting go. What you let go of may be different from one person to another, but wealth is particularly challenging for people through the centuries because it promises security. It promises control and power over your circumstances. Well, that's the promise anyway. The man's face fell. He went away sad. Given that wealth was considered a sign of blessing in the first century, as it must be said in the 21st century, Jesus' attention to the burden of financial wealth in life would have been stunning. The disciples were startled, we're told. But notice how when the man runs up to Jesus, he kneels. A gesture of humility, we imagine. And yet everywhere else in Mark, when a person kneels down to ask something of Jesus, it's a request for healing. Does Mark present this scene as a healing and invite us to do the same? Is wealth and prosperity something we need to be healed from? How hard is it for the rich to be faithful, to experience wholeness in life and whatever life comes then after life? Camels were the largest living creatures Jesus and his listeners would have ever seen. And the eye of a needle was probably the smallest aperture he could imagine. This can't be done. It's not a trick of words. It can't be done. The willingness to let go comes as a gift. But if your arms are already full of gifts and baggage, how are you going to receive anything unless you let go of some of that? We are wealthy today in ways that people centuries ago would have no concept of. And yet St. Augustine, writing in the 5th century, captures a sense of psychology, a psychology that's enduringly human. He wrote, wealth is gained with toil and kept with fear. It's hard to live life fully and wholly if we have possessions and impossible if we love them. Wealth is gained with toil and kept with fear. It's hard to live fully and wholly if we have possessions and impossible if we love them. Why is it so difficult for the rich to enter into God's completeness or the kingdom? Is it the belief that one is made self-sufficient by one's wealth with no need for God or others? 
Is it that we are desensitized to the needs of others by our wealth? From the needs of those around us? Jesus does not tell the man to simply separate himself from his wealth, his possessions, to burn them or walk away from them, but to give them to the poor. In other words, sharing in the hardships and the needs of others as a requirement of life in God's way. Wealth distances us from one of the elements of being human itself, that is the dimension of being dependent on others, vulnerable. Wealth removes us from the interdependence of the human community and we lose in that reality something of our humanity. Jesus calls the man back into relationship and even solidarity with his neighbor, both for the sake of that neighbor, but also for the man's own well-being. Poverty is not the focus. Jesus' primary call is not a call to a life of poverty, but to a life of discipleship. Jesus' disciples have indeed, as Peter points out, already let go of so much in their lives. At the, at the conclusion of this passage that Jean read, Peter does not boast of these sacrifices, but continues to panic about securing eternal life, fullness of life with God. What hope is there for him, he cries. In response, Jesus explains that deprivation is not the touchstone of God's kingdom. Authentic community and care are. For Jesus, the opposite of scarcity isn't abundance. It's accumulation. The image of Jesus that many of us are most comfortable with is the itinerant preacher who, who had no poverty who had no property, who had no privately held money, and lived with few worldly possessions. And so we're, we're confused when Jesus is extravagant in his consumption, which he often is. The kingdom of God is like a wayward child who returns home after wasting half his father's fortune, and in response, the father throws him a lavish party. A shepherd, refusing all logic, leaves 99 sheep vulnerable while he goes off in search of the one. Jesus produces more wine at the first public miracle in Cana than could be drunk at a hundred weddings, and the guests were already drunk. He and his disciples have a reputation for being gluttons and drunks, we're told. Accumulation, not extravagance and abundance. Here's the thing. This man comes to Jesus for a reason. He knows there's something wrong. He's done everything right, and yet he still experiences this certain dis-ease. We might not frame it in terms of eternal life, but the young man's question is a question that people ask every day around us, in our society. How can I find meaning? How can I find purpose, fulfillment? I have two university degrees. I have a six-figure income. I own a house that's been renovated to my specifications. My kids are thriving and embarked on great careers. I have a, a new electric car, so I'm doing my bit for climate change. We have fabulous holidays, and yet there's this empty feeling. The Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor, in his amazing book, A Secular Age, refers to this modern malaise as the Peggy Lee question. Is that all there is? Is that all there is, my friend? from her hit 1969 song. Charles Taylor writes, there has to be more to life than our current definition of social and individual success defines for us. Is that all there is? The man in the story is also asking Jesus about that more, about the more. 
but his question points to what needs to be added, the next step. But he discovers instead that eternal life, however you describe it or imagine it, involves letting go. The surrender of one's whole self, which means different things to different people, but for this man and possibly for many of us, it was about wealth. In the end, the story is untamable. Like a parable, it resists simple explanations and it defies loopholes, leaving us a little uncomfortable, leaving us with questions. Like a parable, it needs to be experienced, to be lived and wrestled with together rather than be explained. Perhaps you too have asked at times the Peggy Lee question, is that all there is? I know I have. And we can talk about that. Oh, man. A blessing of hope. A fierce and tenacious hope. Hope despite. Hope regardless. Hope still. Hope where we had ceased to hope. Hope amid what threatens hope. Hope with those who share our hope. Hope beyond what we had hoped. Hope that makes a way where there is no way. Hope that takes us past our fear. Hope that calls us into life. Hope that blesses what is to come with peace. Go in peace. Amen.